Ah, Banjo-Kazooie, a game that just never seems to get old. So there's this witch called Grunthilda who thinks she's the most prettiest thing in the whole entire world. Personally, I think that Mount of Dirt looks better than her. Then her talking cauldron Dingpot tells her of a little cub bear that's actually prettier than her. She can't take it and flies off to kidnap Tootie with a plan to steal her good looks and make them hers. Hey, at least it's better than giving her a poison apple. She then captures Tootie right outside of Banjo's house. And if Banjo was up five minutes earlier, the whole thing would have stopped right there. Maybe next time, Banjo won't be up till five in the morning playing Tetris. In order to save Tootie, Banjo and Kazooie will have to collect a bunch of different things while exploring the inside of Grandilda's tower and overcome the challenges of the nine worlds inside the tower. You'll meet a bunch of different characters, overcome obstacles, and play a trivia board game, all in your quest to save Tootie from being uglified. Ugh. Once you begin the game, you'll meet Bottles the Mole, who will tell you everything that happened and is responsible for teaching you all the moves in the game. If you've played the game before, you can skip all the basic moves at the beginning, but you'll still want to explore the area around you, so you can increase your health before entering Grantilda's Tower and the nine worlds that await you. Once inside, you'll discover the two most important items in the game. The first one being these golden jigsaw pieces, called Jiggies. Use these Jiggies to fill in the pictures that open up the next world. And music notes that you collect within the world that open up the music note doors that allow you to progress further into Gruntilda's lair. Just to let you know, there are a hundred music notes within each world, and ten jiggies to collect in the worlds and within Gruntilda's lair. The music notes are easy to pick up, but the jiggies must be obtained through challenges such as collecting a bunch of items and then giving it to the right person or by defeating opponents larger than you. Or defeating a large number of enemies. Or by collecting these five different colored creatures known as Jinjos within each world. Find all five and you'll be rewarded with a Jiggy. And many, many other ways. But don't think that you can do this all by yourself, because you'll be needing the help from two other people to help you on your quest. Remember Bottles the Mole from earlier? Well, you'll meet him in the first six worlds, and he'll be teaching Kazooie all the new moves in the game. Notice I said Kazooie and not Banjo, because most of these moves revolve around Kazooie using her own abilities to enhance Banjo's. I mean, Banjo really can't do anything on his own except climb trees and poles. It's even faster to walk as Kazooie. You'll learn to use the waiting boots, which can get you through dangerous territory that would cause damage to you if you weren't wearing them. The running shoes, which allow Kazooie to run faster than normal at a limited time. The shock disc pad, which allows you to jump higher. And collectible items, such as the blue eggs, which allow you to open up new areas. Solve certain puzzles. Or to be used as a way to attack. Gold feathers used for invincibility, and the best way to kill annoying enemies such as Snacker. And red feathers that allow you to fly in the air with the help of a flying disc pad. Oh, and those skull tokens? Those are from Mumbo Jumbo, the other help you get. Collect enough of them, and Mumbo Jumbo will transform Banjo and Kazooie into different types of animals and objects though they really don't enhance anything. In fact, they're only used to get to new areas that Banjo and Kazooie couldn't reach. They can't even defend themselves with the exception of the crocodile. The only other one that's actually fun to play as is the Bumblebee, which allows Banjo and Kazooie to have unlimited flight. There's also Cheetah the Spellbook, who can give you codes, and Brentilda, who can give you advice for the trivia game. But to be honest, you can beat the game without their help. The game has a lot of variety, and just this playful nature to it. A better example for that would have to be in one of my favorite worlds, Freeze Easy Peak. You'll have to do a lot of different tasks, such as defeating the Twinkly Munchers so the Twinkly Lights can go light up a Christmas tree, or sledding down a giant snowman's scarf, 
and land right on the owner of the sled, who ate a Jiggy. And then he'll challenge you to two different sled races. A bit of advice? You'll never beat him in the second race unless you have the running shoes. So make a quick stop in Gobi's Valley so you won't have to backtrack. And dive bombing these snowmen is always a good time. And you know what, I just dive bombed the heck of them just for the fun of it. I didn't even know it would earn me a jiggy. Same thing for dive bombing those buttons on the giant snowman. I just did it for fun. You know, this giant snowman reminds me of another classic N64 platforming masterpiece, Mario 64. And it's not just that. It's a lot of other similarities such as the desert with pyramids, a haunted mansion, and similar moves such as the backflip and ground pound. While it may have felt like it was copying Super Mario 64, what it really did was just expand everything that Mario started and added more to it. And because it plays so great, you won't even care. The one thing it lacks from Mario 64 is the ability to replay certain events again. For example, the Gruntilda boss fight was a lot of fun and very challenging at some points, but once you've done it, you can't beat her again unless you start a new file. And that trivia board game near the end was actually a lot of fun. It was asking you questions about the game and had you replay certain events from it. This could have been a great multiplayer experience. It could have been like Mario Party. Everybody's trying to get to the end, they answer a question right, they move ahead, and after everybody's taken their turn, you get to play an event from the game that will let you move an extra space if you want. That could have been awesome! While you don't have to collect every music note in the game, you at least have to collect 90 from each world. But instead of collecting them and them disappearing, it just keeps track of the highest that you got from each world. They'll respawn if you die or leave the world. This actually doesn't bug me except for Clickpock Wood, and this death trap in Rusty Bucket Bay. The only other time it ever really bugged me was when I was recording footage for the music walkthrough and the game just froze on me before I could get to the last 10 music notes. I've heard that the Xbox Live Arcade version has it where if you collect a music note, you don't have to worry about getting it again. And if that's true, that's a great improvement. And if you had this game from 1998 to 2000, you know exactly what I'm about to talk about. Yeah, stop and swap. If you beat the game with all 100 Jiggies, Mumbo Jumbo will show you pictures of three hidden objects hidden in the game. For two years, these secrets haunted the players of Banjo-Kazooie. We didn't know what the eggs or the key did, or even how to get them. And it wasn't until Banjo-Tooie finally came out that we finally got some answers. So what do the eggs and the key do? Well, nothing. You can get them, but you can't do anything with them. You can't even transfer them to Banjo-Tooie like you're supposed to. Oh, and how do you get these secrets? You type in this really long code in Treasure Trove Co's Sandcastle. It's a little disappointing that after two years, these secret items don't even do anything for the game, or even function the way they were supposed to. And I used to have dreams about how to get these items, and sometimes Snacker one hot my nightmares. You know, this game was in my dreams a lot more than any other game I've ever played, and that's both symbolic and ironic because its code name was Project Dream. The best theory I've heard so far is that you're supposed to switch the cartridges while the N64 was still on because the RAM had this little glitch where it still had the memory stored for 10 seconds after it was left on. And I can believe that because when my game froze, it still saved all the data I had up until the point that it froze. However, in 1999, Nintendo came out with a new model of the N64 that reduced the time from 10 seconds to 1 second. Rare decided that that wasn't enough time and stopped the idea. I can understand that, but why didn't they have a plan B like, say, oh, I don't know, a memory card to transfer the data? Regardless, Banjo-Kazooie is one of the best games to ever grace the N64. It's full of colorful characters, playful environments, and a charm that just never gets old. Yeah, there's some glitches, but you have to go out of your way for them. And there were so many great secrets in this game, some of them are really hard to find such as when Mumbo Jumbo tells you he's going to transform you into a giant T-Rex so you can go stomp the witch, but decides he'll save it for the next game. Or a different animation during the file select screen. And there's also a great running gag here and there. Such as how Gruntilda will talk to you when you're walking around in her lair. And the music is one of the best on the N64, and I love how it interchanges without stopping. There's just so much packed into this game that it's really hard not to truly enjoy it. A 5 out of 5. It's a great game to add to your collection.